we're all dinosaur fans. Everyone who does the type of work we do is a dinosaur fan. So we said we'll do some drawings just to see if our concept and our feeling is in sync with what Steven's looking for in this film. On a warm summer evening in 1993, the world witnessed a remarkable moment in the world of paleontology. Professor John Ostrom, a renowned paleontologist from the Yale Peabody Museum of Natural History, watched as one of the discoveries came to life on the big screen. That discovery was none other than the notorious Velociraptors, brought to life by the creative genius of Steven Spielberg in his epic adaptation of Michael Crichton's best-selling novel Jurassic Park. Working closely with Spielberg and Crichton, they delved into the mysteries of the past to bring these incredible creatures back to life. The primary inspiration behind the movie's Velociraptors was the Deinonychus, a fierce Cretaceous predator whose fossilized remains were unearthed in the rugged landscapes of Montana back in 1964. But the story of the terrible claw began long before Jurassic Park took the world by storm. The enigmatic Deinonychus had already captured the imaginations of paleontologists even before its true nature was fully understood. The early Deinonychus finds were frustratingly elusive. The fossils were trapped in such hard rock that our knowledge of this remarkable predator remained obscure for decades. They were, in a sense, lost to time. It wasn't until the fateful year of 1964 in Bridger, Montana, that a remarkable collection of over 1,000 fossils emerged, representing the majority of Deinonychus skeletons ever discovered. The story of Deinonychus doesn't end with its initial discovery. Additional fossils have surfaced in various corners of the United States, unveiling a deeper tale of prehistoric wonder. From the rugged terrains of Montana to the arid expanses of Utah, the fossil-rich landscapes of Wyoming, and the fossil beds of Oklahoma, Deinonychus has left its mark in the annals of paleontology. But the Deinonychus mystery extended even farther east, as tantalizing teeth fragments believed to belong to this remarkable predator were unearthed in the unexpected terrain of Maryland. In 1969, Professor John Ostrom's groundbreaking description of Deinonychus would ignite a seismic shift in the world of dinosaur paleontology. Some would argue that it was the most pivotal discovery of the 20th century. Ostrom's revelation sparked what would become known as the Dinosaur Renaissance, a transformative era that forever altered our understanding of these ancient creatures. Ostrom was captivated by Deinonychus' striking resemblance to modern birds, a notion that would challenge conventional wisdom. Ostrom's audacious ideas that birds descended from dinosaurs, once considered eccentric, has since solidified as an irrefutable fact, reshaping the very foundation of our understanding. Today, this remarkable theory is embraced by the scientific community and its proponents continue to unravel the intricate connection between these terrible claws and the birds that grace our skies. Championing this paradigm-shifting concept was none other than Ostrom's dedicated disciple, Robert Backer, whose tireless efforts have propelled the theory into the forefront of paleontology. The Deinonychus, once a shadow in the fossil record, has cast a mighty light on our understanding of Earth's prehistoric past. Its legacy lives on, woven into the very fabric of our evolutionary journey. For much of the 20th century, dinosaurs were often compared to their modern reptilian counterparts, creatures that moved at a sluggish pace, lethargic until warmed by the sun's rays. Occasionally, they were exceptions like the agile Struthomimus, which defied the norm. But it took one remarkable discovery to revolutionize our perception of these ancient creatures. That discovery was Deinonychus, a dinosaur that breathed new life into the idea that many of its kinds were not the lumbering behemoths we once imagined. Instead, they were quick, hot-blooded, and dynamic. Deinonychus was equipped with interlocking vertebrae that acted like a tightrope walker's balancing pole. Its feet featured large, formidable claws that challenged everything experts had assumed about dinosaurs. Professor John Ostrom's pioneering discoveries, along with the groundbreaking work of his protege Robert Backer and paleopaleontologist Gregory Paul, ignited what would be dubbed the dinosaur renaissance during the 1970s and 1980s. Their research captured the public's imagination, renewing our fascination with these long extinct creatures and sparking a renewed wave of scientific inquiry. Their work even caught the attention of a certain author, known for penning best-selling science fiction novels, who found inspiration in their discoveries. In the study of paleontology, Deinonychus stands as a beacon of change. While larger and more ferocious looking dinosaurs often steal the spotlight, none have left quite the mark on the history of paleontology as this remarkable predator. If you'd like to keep learning more about Deinonychus, then this video will feature a complete paleontological profile of the terrible claw 
and then attempt to recreate its environment in the game Jurassic World Evolution 2. In the depths of time, during the early Cretaceous period, a formidable predator roamed the ancient landscapes of North America, a creature that would captivate the imaginations of scientists and enthusiasts alike. Meet Deidonychus, a member of the remarkable Dromaeosaur group, a lineage of carnivorous dinosaurs that left their mark on the page of Earth's history approximately 145 to 100 million years ago. This remarkable predator thrived in the vast expanses of western North America where it stalked its prey with its cunning and precision. Based on the precious few fully mature specimens unearthed by paleontologists, we can estimate that Deinonychus reached lengths of up to 11 feet and tipped the scales at a formidable 150 pounds. But what truly set Deinonychus apart were its long razor sharp claws which earned it the nickname Terrible Claw. These fearsome claws weren't unique to Deinonychus. In fact, they were a defining feature shared among its dromaeosaur kin. The second toes of their feet were equipped with an enlarged talon, ready to strike at a moment's notice. What made these talons even more menacing was their hyperextensibility, allowing them to retract almost vertically, a deadly adaptation that made Deinonychus a relentless and agile predator. Deinonychus possessed formidable forelimbs, equipped with three razor-sharp claws on each hand, perfectly suited for gripping and immobilizing its prey. However, it's infamous killing claw, located on the second toe of each foot, that truly defines this fearsome predator. Contrary to the slashing motion often depicted in popular media, recent research suggests that this claw was primarily a stabbing weapon, designed for precision rather than brute force. This intriguing concept is known as raptor prey restraint, and finds echoes in the behaviors of many modern birds of prey. It involves seizing the prey with sharp talons and using the wings to maintain balance while delivering the decisive blow. This tactic is especially effective against smaller prey, where the predator's weight pins the prey to the ground, ensuring a swift and efficient kill. But Deinonychus, a formidable predator in its own right, was not limited to smaller targets. In daring encounters with larger prey, it would have utilized its forelimbs for support and balance, showcasing the adaptability of this apex predator. As we delve deeper into the world of Deinonychus, we uncovered intriguing mysteries about its hunting strategies and physical adaptations. The formidable Deinonychus boasted a skull nearly a foot and a half long, its bones wide to accommodate powerful biting muscles. Its jaws were lined with approximately 70 curved blade-like teeth, capable of easily puncturing bone. These teeth, intriguingly, have been found alongside the remains of the herbivorous dinosaur Tenontosaurus, hinting at an enthralling interaction between predator and prey. One of Deinonychus's unique attributes was his association with Tenontosaurus. These discoveries led to the intriguing notion that Deinonychus, like its cousins, may have hunted in coordinated packs, a theory that shaped the portrayal of raptors in the Jurassic Park franchise. However, this theory is not without its complexities. Questions arise when we consider whether the bone beds represent hunting scenes or if the fossils were washed together during burial. Furthermore, the behavior of modern predators like crocodiles and Komodo dragons offers a different perspective. They often compete at kills rather than cooperate, challenging the pack hunting hypothesis. Recent insights suggest that Deinonychus may have primarily targeted smaller prey, employing their infamous foot claws to pin them down, akin to the tactics of modern birds of prey. Juvenile Deinonychus's dietary evidence indicates that young and adults may have pursued different food sources, challenging the concept of familial pack structures. Yet, traces of group behavior exist among related dromaeosaurs. Another intriguing aspect is Deinonychus's potential feather covering. Although no skin impressions have been found, evidence suggests that Deinonychus, like its relatives, wore feathers. These feathers would have covered most of its body, creating a striking resemblance to a flightless eagle, blending grace with ferocity. Even Deinonychus's reproductive mysteries persist. While Deinonychus eggs remains relatively scarce in the fossil record, a likely candidate suggests that they laid distinctive blue eggs adorned with brown blotches. Now, let's address the often misconceived notion of Deinonychus's speed and agility. Contrary to the pulse-pounding portrayals in Jurassic Park, Deinonychus is what is a sprinter we might imagine. Instead, it likely trotted at a modest 6 miles per hour while pursuing its prey. 
As we journey through the history of time, we arrive at the end of the Cretaceous period, around 66 million years ago, a time when Deinonychus and its fellow non-avian dinosaurs met their abrupt demise. The cause of their extinction remains a subject of spirit debate. It is believed that a convergence of factors, including climate change, volcanic activity, and the devastating impact of an asteroid brought the reign of these magnificent creatures to a close. The tale of Deinonychus unfolds in the history of paleontology, beginning with its initial discovery in 1931 in the rugged landscapes of southern Montana near the town of Billings. Fossilized remnants of this remarkable predator have since emerged from the ancient rock layers of the Cloverleaf Formation in Montana and Wyoming, as well as the contemporaneous Antlers Formation in Oklahoma, all within the vast expanse of North America. Ironically, it was a renowned American paleontologist, Barnum Brown, who stumbled upon Deinonychus during his quest for an entirely different dinosaur, the duckbilled giant Tenontosaurus. Brown's discovery left him rather uninterested in the smaller raptor he had chanced upon, which he temporarily dubbed Daptosaurus. Plans were made for description and display, yet they were left unfinished. It wasn't until over three decades later in 1964 that paleontologist John Ostrom spearheaded an expedition from Yale's Peabody Museum of Natural History. Their quest led them to Bridger, Montana, where they uncovered a treasure trove of skeletal remains. In February 1969, Ostrom unveiled his groundbreaking findings, assigning the name Deinonychus anteropus to the extensive remains. The species name, Anteropus, evoked Ostrom's notion about the tail's role in maintaining balance during pursuits. Despite the wealth of bones, many crucial fossils were missing or challenging to identify. Ostrom's later investigations, alongside Grant E. Meyer, unveiled that Brown's Megadontosaurus and Daptosaurus were in fact the same species which Ostrom named Microvenator. In 2000, paleontologists Gerald grellet Tinner and Peter Makovicki made an intriguing discovery while examining unprepared material, a cluster of overlooked abdominal ribs within lime case blocks. These same blocks also concealed a treasure trove of fossilized eggshells, likely belonging to Deinonychus. Remarkably, one eggshell was closely associated with the abdominal ribs, suggesting that Deinonychus incubated its eggs. This revelation hints at Deinonychus' endothermic nature, akin to modern birds, using body heat for incubation. Meanwhile, the intriguing question of Deinonychus' feathers continues to torment paleontologists. While direct evidence is scarce, the bird-like anatomy of Deinonychus and its close relatives suggest the presence of feathers, though none have been confirmed in Deinonychus itself. You can catch a glimpse of Deinonychus today at the American Museum of Natural History, where a skeleton, including bones from the original AMNH 3015 specimen, stands as a testament to his prehistoric might. Another specimen, MCZ-4371, can be found on display at the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard University. The discovery of Deinonychus serves as a testament to the tireless work of paleontologists worldwide, who continue to excavate and study fossils, unraveling the intricate tapestry of Earth's ancient history. Deinonychus, the formidable predator of its time, roamed ancient landscapes teeming with life. These environments within the Cloverly and Antlers Formation were havens of prehistoric biodiversity. Inhabitants of these regions were transported to a bygone era where floodplains stretch as far as the eye could see. The world brimmed with subtropical forests, deltas, and serene lagoons. The Earth's climate during Deinonychus' reign was markedly warmer and more humid than the world we know today. In this paradise, floodplains played host to luxuriant vegetation, boasting a mosaic of ferns, conifers, cycads, and early flowering plants. While the lush grasslands we envision today may have been absent, a rich tapestry of plant species painted the landscape. But the world in which Deinonychus thrived was not static. Over the ages, there was a dramatic shift in plant life, marked by the emergence of flowering plants and eventually the rise of grasses. However, Throughout much of Deinonychus' time, these new flowering plants coexisted with conifers, ferns, and ancient ginkgos, remnants from the bygone Jurassic era. Forests, dense and diverse, were dominated by needle-leaf conifers like the mighty sequoia. Yet, a transformation was underway as broad-leaf trees began to ascend. Within this ancient realm, one finds a peculiar Temskia fern, 
with its vibrious false trunk and crown of leaves resembling a young cedar or redwood rather than the traditional tree fern. As the late Cretaceous era unfolded, the landscapes were adorned with early flowers, such as the magnolia and water lilies. These were the heralds of a new botanical era, the age of angiosperms, marked by the most iconic feature, the flower. However, not all plant species thrived. As the flowering plants gained dominance towards the end of the Cretaceous period, ancient ginkgos and cycads found themselves in decline. Most dinosaurs were drawn to the lifeline of rivers and streams where life flourished. These ancient waterways, different in configuration from their modern counterparts, meandered through the land, carrying sediment and sometimes flooding the adjacent floodplains during heavy rains or snowmelt. In conclusion, the environments within the Cloverleaf and Atlas formation were vibrant and ever evolving. These ancient landscapes have bestowed upon us a treasure trove of fossils, illuminating the remarkable tapestry of life during the late Cretaceous period. The ancient realms of the Cloverleaf and Atlas formation were a crucible of prehistoric life, where a rich tapestry of creatures thrived. This abundant environment yielded a treasure trove of fossils, offering a window into the astonishing biodiversity of this bygone world. These formations have gifted us a diverse array of fossilized organisms, from the colossal to the minuscule, including dinosaurs, small mammals, birds, and even insects. Together, they unveil the intricate tapestry of ecosystems and life forms that once flourished there. Within these formations, Deinonychus left its mark closely intertwined with the ornithopod Tenontosaurus. Teeth discovered alongside Tenontosaurus remains hint at a complex relationship. Whether through hunting or scavenging, Deinonychus played a role in the fate of these herbivores. Deinonychus navigated an intricate web of life, occupying a middle rung on the food chain. Formidable challenges loom, including colossal theropods like the 40-foot giants Acrocanthosaurus and Seots that ruled the apex. In the nearby seas, a different set of dangers lurked. Giant crocodilians like Gonopholus and Paloxysuchus prowled the waters. The land teemed with towering theropods such as Seroposeidon, Astrodon, Brontomerus, and Abidosaurus. For Deinonychus, smaller and medium-sized dinosaurs were the likely prey including the one-ton Hadrosaur Aeolambia, the small Ceratopsian Aqualops, the swift Cephorosaurus, and the small Overaptor Microvenator. Mammals too were a common place in this prehistoric tapestry, offering Deinonychus a potential source of sustenance. Among them were creatures like Atocotheridium, Gobiconodon, Oclatheridium, and Paraximixonis. Yet, armored dinosaurs stood as formidable challenges within their formidable defenses. Notosaurus like the 18-foot-long Pelleroplites, the smaller 10-foot Animantarchs, the massive 23-foot Tatanxephalus, and the well-known 17-foot-long Ceropelta held their ground. Ankylosaurids, including the 23-foot-long Ceropelta and the 16-foot-long Gastonia, were equally well-protected. It's worth noting that the precise fauna would have varied based on Deinonychus' location and the unique ecosystem it inhabited. Our current understanding of Deinonychus and its contemporaries is rooted in the fossil record, a testament to the ever-evolving knowledge of our prehistoric past as new discoveries continue to reshape our understanding. Deinonychus, a name that echoes through popular culture, forever etched as the iconic model for the raptors of Jurassic Park. Yet, the term raptor, now synonymous with the agile predators, originates from Velociraptor, a smaller dromaeosaur, far smaller than the towering Deinonychus. Author Michael Crichton, crafting the Jurassic Park novel, embarked on a quest for knowledge. His destination, the office of John Ostrom, the pioneer who unearthed Deinonychus. Their conversation ignited Crichton's imagination, shaping the raptors of his novel. Crichton's Velociraptor was in essence Deinonychus in almost every detail as Ostrom revealed. In a dramatic twist, Crichton renamed his novels Deinonychus to Velociraptor for its sheer dramatic flair. As the silver screen beckoned, Steven Spielberg's team reached out to John Ostrom for technical insight. The film, initially intended to accurately portray Deinonychus, even boasting concept art, but the allure of Velociraptor prevailed for its sheer coldness factor. Within the Jurassic Park universe, Deinonychus' presence wasn't planned on Isla Nublar. Yet, behind the scenes, InGen cloned Deinonychus between 2005 and 2015. 
Sadly, it faced a cruel fate, declared extinct during the Mount Saibo eruption in 2018. In the innovation center of Jurassic World, Dino Nikus briefly graced a holoscape screen, a tantalizing glimpse of what would have been. Plans for its appearance in Jurassic World Dominion shifted, replaced by the enigmatic Atrociraptor. However, the digital realm embraced Dinonychus. In the Lost World Jurassic Park game, it roamed as an enemy, albeit smaller than reality. Dubbed Dinon Raptor, it ventured alongside its cinematic counterpart, the Velociraptor. Jurassic Park 3 park builder Dinonychus could be recreated, while Jurassic Park Operation Genesis initially considered its inclusion, though ultimately favoring the Velociraptor. Dinonychus resurfaces in Jurassic World Evolution where it captivates visitors as a dinosaur attraction. With a rooster-like comb on its head and a fleshy ridge along its tail, it wowed guests. In Jurassic World Alive, a bold depiction featured feathers and wings, unlike prior renditions. Dinonychus, a dinosaur of many faces, showcased in video games, movies, and novels. Its legacy continues to evolve, a testament to the enduring fascination within these prehistoric marvels. Hey everyone, so uh, if you're still watching, this is going to go ahead and uh, show you my park right here that's been worked on for quite a bit. Um, this side is where I keep all of my carnivores, so I've named it Carnivore Land after a certain theme park. And Dino Nikes is going to be put right here. We're going to do, based on what we saw in red, I'm going to go with a nice little floodplain, a nice river some channel deposits, nice very rocky area, and then we'll finish it off by uh, having a nice forested area uh, for our Dinonychus uh, packs. So first things first, let's go ahead and do our water. So since we have this body of water right here, let's just go ahead and continue it off. And since we wanna have a lot of open space for our Dinonychus to go ahead and hunt our goats and whatever else we're gonna put in there, and let's not go ahead and put it all the way down here, but let's go ahead and just expand it. And after that, let's just go ahead and make sure that we are cutting it a bit and making it actually look like a river. So we'll go ahead and do that. Now it looks too uniform, so we'll just do a couple of things right here. Kind of change things around. That looks pretty good, but it looks kind of, you know, even, so we'll kind of do that. Let's expand this just a little bit more. And since we are doing some channel deposits over here, we are kind of going to want to like expand kind of like that and then just kind of build some gaps here and there. Let's see if we can continue it over this way. Chop this off. Keep this. And you just kind of have to like chop in and out for the rivers and everything like that. Uh, but once you're satisfied, which I kind of am here, we'll jump over to our uh, elevation. So that elevation is just going to add a bit more depth to our enclosure. Um, since we want a lot of open space, we're not going to do too much. We're just going to race terrain all around the rivers. Um, so um, let's go ahead and just build this part right here. Again, not that high. We're just barely going to scratch the surface. These channel deposits right here, we'll raise them just a little bit. And that's about as much as we're going to do for this. So we'll keep it like that. This is what kind of keeps the river, um, you know, that's what it keeps it forming. That's what, how it makes it look like. So after that, we'll just kind of slightly tap it, smooth the terrain a bit and we'll leave it like that now that we have that let's go ahead and put our feeder so our goats are going to go over here since we want them to run around and this is where our um dino nikuses are mostly going to be having uh, their open space so we'll add it right here next to this viewing area that way the guests can see them run out and they can have fun watching the cub die i guess uh, this next one is going to be a regular meat feeder, and we're going to go ahead and put it right about here in front of this viewing area, and then this viewing area right here. So we'll go ahead and put that right there. After that, let's go ahead and put our little uh, ranger post. Um, since we want them, you know, the jeep to kind of come over here, 
we don't want him to go all the way over there but you know i kind of think we are gonna have to do that just so um you know it looks like a jeep goes through here and they're actually you know monitoring the animals so we'll put that one right there and now that we have that let's go ahead and do our rocks we'll go um a group of rocks as i always like to do you can pick whatever color you like but since we are doing a sort of tropical environment we can go with the temperate rocks or the tropical rocks i'm gonna go with the um temperate rocks i feel like that one's a bit better for what we're trying to do here so you know just kind of add groups of rocks here and there i like to group them in threes but you know, there's always that little randomized setting that you can use, which I really do enjoy. So let's go ahead and have fun with that. Again, not too many, a couple here and there. This is gonna be the rocky side of the uh, map, but um, this can actually be the part where, you know, they kind of nest and this is where they sleep. This is gonna be like there part where they go ahead and you know take shelter so we'll do that a couple more you know i just took away their <laughs> that little area they had to shelter in and once we're done with that let's go ahead and add that decoration that we have here um of course we are gonna have dinosaurs here and of course they are gonna have to uh, you know poop so we'll add one right here since we have a feeling that they're all going to be chilling out here and you know doing their business and unfortunately since the feeder is over here we'll go ahead and add this one you know unfortunately it's going to be something along the lines of here unfortunately the guests are going to have to smell that but that's just part of being in a dinosaur park with giant dinosaurs and the next part is going to be our forest our um our plant life we're not going to keep it too diverse. We're just going to go ahead and cap some, you know, some regular foliage or conifer trees. So we'll add some of these guys. Actually, let's not add these guys because we're having all the palm trees. Um, let's actually go with our Temskia. So we're going to add some Temskia here. It's mostly going to be all of this part right here. So let's just go ahead and add it. Since we are doing a bit of... Um, open plains we are going to take some of these away and go ahead and replace them with either the fibrous ground cover or the leafy climbers i do like the leafy climbers because it does have that piece of wood that's right there and since we are in the cretaceous period we do have hints of flowering plants which those locks kind of represent a bit here and there they do show some plants so we've done that let's do one more let's take away one of these tree barks one of these temps yeah there we go perfect so we'll add this one keep it just like that and we're gonna keep the um that going this way let's go ahead and keep our temps though as our main foliage right here since we do have some channel deposits Let's do a little bit of cycads. This time they're kind of dying off, so we are not going to add too many. And the only other thing is just adding a bit more temp secure just right here. And if you want, you can put some ginkgos up here on the top, but I'm just going to leave it like that. Add a bit more temp secure. I do feel like kind of did a bit too low on it. And then finally, we're going to go this side and we're going to put the individual tall conifer trees that are going to act like they were sequoias and such like that. So, you know, it is going to take some time, but at the end, it's going to look very, very nice. So make sure you diversify your trees so it doesn't look too um, uniform. At the same time, don't add too many because then those dinosaur or dinosaurs aren't going to walk through there any add uh, any more. Add a couple more. Not going to make it too foresty. There, you can see now that the uh, you know the enclosure is taking shape. 
It's looking a bit more lively. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's your enclosure, so you can do whatever you want. But this is kind of what I had in mind for this Dino Knight. It's, um, you know, some nice forested terrain where they would mostly hide and do most of their hunting, or that's where they would pop out and hunt. And then the wide open plains, so they can, you know, run out and hunt their prey and at the same time kind of just bask in the sun and have their social interactions um, in the view of everyone so they can enjoy them being dinosaur and doing dinosaur things you know so I think we're at some of trees if you want you can add a bit more you know um, of the Temskia down there if you'd like Um, but now the only thing that we have left is our terrain. So mostly everything is grass because of what I mentioned. We do have some dirt, which is going to be the little, um, the most trafficked areas, if you will. So we're not going to be, you know, using a lot, but yeah, these are going to be the most trafficked areas with the Jeeps and the, you know, the dinosaurs kick up dirt from running around just doing the thing so the most traffic spot seems to be this we'll say that the jeep has to go through here through here as well this is going to be really traffic area so it's going to be really dirty same with this part the jeep unfortunately has to go around this big pile of poop and the ranger post is going to be really 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 trampled if you want to have more of a trampled look, we can go ahead and do a bit more of the rock, a bit of more texture. Uh, so we'll just do that. Kind of like the most traffic spots. You can even that darker rock if you like. You know what? We'll I'll keep this one. This one looks better. A little bit darker tone. It looks like more dirt. So we'll add that. And then the only other thing I guess we want to do is add some sand for our channel deposit. So that's going to be your sand over here. And, you know, that's pretty much about it. That's going to be your channel deposits. And the only other thing is just maybe adding a bit of rock over here to the water, especially to give it a bit of depth. Maybe covering a bit of this. And you know, this little part is very, very empty. So if you want, you can, you know, ginkgos, you can put some cycads. I want to put some ginkgos. So we'll add some ginkgos here. And we'll finish it off like that. So um, there you have it. This is going to be our Deinonychus enclosure. This is... <laughs> The main viewing area but uh, i'll go ahead and add the dynamicus and uh, you guys can go ahead and see how it'll look so uh thanks for watching this sickle clawed raptor with its long knife-like claws and elegant frame make dino Nikus a beautiful but deadly addition to your jurassic park thank you all for watching i hope you enjoyed this video don't forget to like and subscribe for more see you in the next one